when we first realized Ken could not see, he was past the age when you know that normal children should be seeing, which is three months. We kept saying to ourselves, he's slow, it, it's going to come. And the doctors diagnosed his problem as congenital nystagmus. Congenital meaning it was from birth, and nystagmus meaning that there was a movement of the eye. But behind the optic nerve, they explained to us, from there to the brain, there was some connection that just was not connected. And as the doctor said, there are so many wires back there that no way could you connect them. And that was the very first time that we made ourselves realize that Ken did not see. And then the tears just gushed. And I cried, and my husband cried, and then I think from that moment on, we knew that Ken did not see. Come with me, walk with me, or oh, run with me, fly with me. We will roam the Father's land together. Well, come with me, Walk with me, yes, run with me, fly with me. We will roam the Father's land together. Living in his everyday love, guided by his everyday power. We will feel the warmth of the sun above. We will know the loveliness of every hour, every hour. Come with me, walk with me, run with me. Fly with me, we will roam the Father's land together. Oh yes, we will roam the Father's land together. Ken was not pampered at all, and that was the beauty of the Association for the Blind. We were told a million times to treat our children just as normally as we possibly could. And that's exactly what we did. We took them sliding, we took them tobogganing, we took them to the beach. We did all these things where they would not otherwise have had the experience. So we did not pamper them, not at all. In fact, many people will tell you that we were very harsh with our children. But it was only doing what we knew had to be done because we wanted them to grow up to be very normal. And teaching Ken to water ski was kind of a hard job because of the condition that I mean, uh, he was in. And, and But although we can start off to say that he was not ever afraid of water. The only problem was letting him off. We decided that the only way he could know where he was when he was ready to get off is to have the driver of the boat get him in front of the cottage or wherever we were, pull the power back, and he would sink down. He, and it worked out very well. He just let that rope pull him up and just followed the rope and let the, felt that the rope was going to take him wherever he wanted to go. Oh, how well I remember yesterday When all my skies were cloudy and gray moment came when I was pregnant for my second child and when she was born and after three months we decided she did not have sight that she was also blind. Hank was a big help to me. He was a strong one and he was a big source of strength because he kept saying we can make it, we've got each other, we've got our love for God to help us through. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. There was lots of, yeah, lots of times we would lay down and pray and pray and say, Lord, 
where are you going to, what's this thing all about? Tell us. Give us a reason. Why? He said, hey, wait a minute. We'll tell you in our good time. Let's just wait, wait upon him. And then he tells us more and more and more and more. But at those hard times, they were not easy. Believe me. I don't remember being angry at my parents for the blindness thing. I remember being angry at the blindness because people would do things that I couldn't do. And kids would play with me for a while. We, we'd, go, we'd go sliding and, and uh, we'd play in my yard. And, and then they would go off to do something that, that would be a visual thing. They'd go off to play baseball or they'd go off to, to um, ride bikes down the street where I couldn't go. I could only go on the sidewalk around the block. <laughs> I still have dreams of being able to go for limitless amounts of time riding down the street on the bicycle. But they would go off to do things that I couldn't do and then, and then I'd, I'd get angry. The childish anger about the blindness may have been a factor that led me away from uh, my Christian upbringing. I was brought up in the church, and I went to church week after week after week after week. And, and I always thought it was the repressive church environment that, that drove me away. Mm. By the time I was in 10th grade, my goodness, I didn't want to have a thing to do with the church. I couldn't stand it. Hated every minute of it. Hated going to a Christian high school. Uh, I wrote articles about about uh, the repressive administration, and I, and, and I was angry, yeah. And then two years into college, I met a girl by the name of Jane Ann Smith, who was a music major, a Texan, a minister's daughter, a Christian, and I flipped. I mean, I flipped. I remember that at the time, I knew the kind of doubts and frustration that he had with his faith, or his lack of faith. I had experienced some of that, but from the inside, as a Christian, I had been comfortable having those same doubts, asking those same questions, but with the label Christianity pasted across them. Ken had not been. And so because I understood the dilemma that he had, it seemed easy to share them with him and to talk about them. You know, I, I had been with Jane for some months now, and, I, and I'd come to love her, and, and I'd, I'd, I had been to church with her some, and, and all the, the feelings of rebellion and anger were, somehow were, were getting wiped away, I guess, because I, I felt that I could be my real self with her, and I wanted so much to be in that, in that loving community. It was a Saturday night in the dormitory, and I just got on my knees, and I said, Lord, I'm going to quit fighting. I can't, I can't hack it anymore. Whatever you're going to do in my life, you just better do it. Huh. All those years growing up in the church, being the good little church kid, all those prayers I had prayed, Lord, we come to thee in the name of thy son, Jesus, etc., etc., I hadn't met a word of it. And now on a Saturday night in a dormitory, not in a church, not walking down an aisle, on that cement floor, I said, Lord, i got to quit fighting. And you just do whatever you're going to do in my life. <laughs> and he did it. Pretending you're a Christian is a luxury you can't afford. Maybe you can fool the people in the church, but you just can't fool the Lord. You know he knows everything you do, knows just how you feel. Cut the act, state the fact, why don't you be for real? Don't play the game, you just can't do it. Don't play the game, you'll see right through it. Don't play the game, you just can't do it. You've got to make a brand new start. Give him your heart. I don't protect Ken at all, not as an artist, nor as a person. Sometimes I have been accused of being calloused because I have watched him be in difficult situations where eventually he fell down or ran into something. I have seen him in social situations where someone might have bailed him out. And I felt it was exciting to watch him meet a challenge. I think if he had too much sheltering, too much protection, too much pampering, even by a wife, it would tend to make him soft and unable to live the exciting kind of life that he does live. He has many times run into signs 
One of the funniest occasions I ever uh, witnessed was Ken running into another person who was blind on the campus. And the fellow turned around to him and said, don't you know I'm blind? And Ken said, no, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. <laughs> that kind of experience I guess I'll always cherish. And yet, they're not reasons to pity him or to feel sorry, but rather just the kind of nutty things that happen to us because life throws up obstacles in everyone's path. <laughs> Shady streets, you know? Yeah. These shadows do weird things. And I get to see, thinking I see things that aren't there, and I miss things that are there. Just miss the cars yeah. and ride. Yeah. <laughs> no, I can the hear shadows those. shadows you can hit, but miss the car. I see. Here comes a car on the left. Walking the straight way, hallelujah, dear. Walking with Jesus all along my way. Let me tell you, I've got to say on a day like today, yes, it's a great, great day just to be alive. Great on the ground beneath my feet, sun in the sky above, happiness in my heart. I'm wrapped up in Jesus' love. Let me tell you, I've got to say on a day like today, Yes, it's a great, great day just to be alive. I want to spread my wings, let go, kick up my heels, want to walk up tall, take a deep breath, see how it feels, I walk in the straight way, hallelujah day, I'm walking with Jesus all along my way. Tell you, I've got to say on a day like today, it's a great, great day just to be alone. He's capable of doing a lot of stuff for a blind person. Stuff like <laughs> playing the piano, for one thing. And he can <laughs> shoot the baskets. That's mine, that's mine, that's mine. That's mine! That's mine! Did you make that? Yes. <laughs> That's mine. That's mine. It's mine. It's mine. Well, I wish he knew what I look like. He can feel me. But like, today I asked him, do you know what the color red looks like? And he said no. Then any breakers on channel six? Hey, French Connection, you got the one songbird, uh, KIS 2102, and how be you? Hey, we're doing fine, how about you? We're sure you're feeling much better than you were there, uh, back to you. Hold it just a minute, I want the shortstop to say a few words to you, and I'll explain it to you later, but uh, here comes uh, my son, the shortstop, he's going to give you a little hello. Yeah, uh, yeah, well, um, listen here, well, we'll be on the side, t um, 10-10. And do you have a 1036? Uh, hmm, not right on, but it's about uh, 220, I believe. Uh, and uh, it's very nice talking with you, uh, shortstop. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, French Connection, uh, <laughs> this song, Bert, I just want to get uh, shortstop kind of oriented into this whole thing and get him, get him talking some. So we're going to have to go... Uh, 10 and 7 for a little while. we got some things going on. And uh, if anybody else is on, Songbird says hello. KIS 2102. The Songbird is going to go uh, 10 7. Well, I think, him, think, think of him like other people. I don't think of him different just because he's blind. Well, sometimes I get like, oh, I just wish he had some other handicap maybe instead of being blind. Because, you know, there's some things that I want him to see. Stuff like the things I make and things I draw. There was a time when I guess I was very, very bitter about blindness, but not anymore. What made the change, I'm not sure exactly. I began to be able to depend a little bit more on my uh, musical skills. And so success or reward or satisfaction began to come from those places, not from the things I couldn't do, but from the things I could do. Stand up, Steve. 
Maybe you feel that way too. Okay, stand up real tall. Okay? As tall as you can. Straight and tall. That's good. Music in its structure, its organization, and somehow has a, has a way of bringing people into reality experience. That's the kind of thing that music therapy does. And needed what I was as a person, and, and needed the love that I had to give uh, to some of the kids, and needed my smile and, and whatever it was that I, that I could offer as a person. And, and I needed them, too. Um, I, I began to discover that it, it didn't matter whether I could see or not. You know, I got my strokes other places. I got my, my success other places, my rewards other places. And I didn't have to try so hard. We can't predict what's going to happen in therapy. But we know that we have to try to use music in some way to help these kids come out of the shell. This little boy, Steve, was particularly reticent at first. And I knew that... Okay. I knew that he, probably more than the others, needed some drawing out. He was afraid, so I focused on him. Hello, 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 everybody. Sing it. Hello, 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 everybody. Sing it with me. Hello, 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 everybody. I want you to sing right after I sing, okay? Okay? My name is Steve. My name is Steve. Here we go. My name is Steve. Okay. I like to walk. I like to walk. I like to talk. Okay, what else do you like to do? I like to talk. Okay. I like to talk. What else do you like to do? I like to. What else do you like to do? Sing. I like to sing. I like to I like to clap. Well, let me hear you clap. I like you. I like to clap. I like you. What else? I like to you to be here. I like you to be here. I like you to be here. For my film. For my film. Now, let's see. I like to sing with you. Sing it. I like to sing with you. I like to sing with you, too. Like I know. Like I know. You know me. You know me. You're Ken. You're Ken. I'm Steve. I'm Steve. I'm not. What? I'm, I'm Steve. I'm Steve. Thank you for coming today. Goodbye. Goodbye. I don't think God is responsible directly for Ken's blindness in the way that a person might ingenuously say that uh, God punished a person by making him handicapped. Nor do I think that God necessarily directly blesses him because he's blind. I rather think that it's one of those coincidental things. That's part of any person's environment. A way in which he finds the world limiting him, cutting off options. And then God blesses him in terms of the way he lives with it, the way he adapts, the way he works with, around, and through that handicap. There are different roles that each of us has from what many men and women select. For example, I do all the driving. I do all of the financial work in our family. He takes out garbage. He helps with dishes. He likes to put her in the kitchen and cook. There are times when I think I'm even glad he's blind because in the gospel of Christ, there's no dichotomy it gives me the chance to do some things with him that other married couples do not do frequently, perhaps. One of them that I like best is reading. I suppose the reason uh, that I'm in the seminary now primarily is because of the input that it gives me 
finding materials that Ken and I can read together. We'll spend two, three, four, five hours a day maybe reading from various books. We've done a lot of material spiritually and mentally because we've been able to share and to bounce off one another. Ken and I both believe that it's certainly within God's power to heal him. I have no leading that that is the Lord's will, however. Neither does Ken. When life is full and rich and full of options for serving the Lord in a meaningful way, and rich with experience, that's good. Then to ask for more is perhaps blasphemous. God does his greatest and most exciting things, I think, when he can make fruit out of what seems to be a fruitless, unproductive, and dead situation. This is Kim. I'm on the road. Won't be back until Monday afternoon If you leave your name and number, please I will be glad to call you soon I get rather disconcerted with the tape-recorded answering machine thing, and so I've decided that uh, people who call me are not going to be subjected to that. They're going to hear music. And I put little ditties on my answering service, uh, ditties like... Um, now, don't hang up on this recording. I don't like recordings either, but I'd really like to know that you have telephoned me. If you leave your name and number when you hear my little beeper, I will be so very glad to call when I get home. <laughs> Since Ken has to live out of a suitcase, I try to make it as easy for him as I can. He has to take more than the amount he wears because I never know what kind of performances he will have, whether they need to be casual or dressy or whether he'll be going out to the beach with somebody. The shoes are different sizes because Ken's feet are really quite different in size. They're seven and a half and ten. He can tell them apart simply by the style of the shoes. Um, the labels that I have, I'm, uh, let me show you some of them. I can put permanent labels in the collars of shirts to coordinate with his slacks. I get them from the Commission for the Blind and they have codes for the different colors and I coordinate them with the color of slacks. Ken always likes to take his own coffee pot of coffee. He says it's because it's more convenient than going down to a restaurant, but actually I think it's because he likes to, to be able to take his own Jamaican coffee that we buy here in Montclair. There are so many people who say, our guest tonight, though he may be physically blind, has greater spiritual insight than any of us. And I sit there and say, hogwash. I've had, I've had numerous people do that to me, and I want to go, I want to go to the microphone and go boom. Because uh, it is not necessarily true that I have deeper spiritual insight because I'm blind. And, and I don't like people making a big thing of it. Uh, I don't like people making a big thing out of, you know, saying, uh, boy, he, he came to our house and, and uh, he, he just got along like an ordinary person. Why, he just, he just walked through the rooms and, and he was able to do so much. And why, I was just amazed. And uh, I have a friend who has asthma. Uh, you know, and, and, and people never say, although he may not be able to breathe our physical air very well, he breathes the air of the spirit. They don't make a big deal out of it. He simply has asthma. It's a characteristic. And blindness can be a characteristic or it can be a handicap. And the, hand, the, the, the handicap is not the blindness. It's what I do with it. I think sometimes very noticeable handicaps like blindness make easier factors to deal with in our lives than the subtle insecurities and problems that we have. I think in some way everybody's handicapped, uh, some to a lesser degree than others, but everybody has some kind of handicap, some kind of paralysis thing that keeps him from functioning or her. A handicap is whatever keeps you from operating at your best. There are no easy answers, I think, for, for easing the problems in our lives brought about by these invisible handicaps. I think rather that we need to resign ourselves to the slow process of disciplines and prayer and study 
and interaction with other people that help us to outgrow these childish things about us. A handicap is not bad. It may be the thing that, that, that motivates. Uh, it may be the thing that triumphing over that handicap may be the thing that motivates you, that really gets you going. Uh, to, to, be able to, uh, to be able to say to whatever paralyzes you, I will triumph over you, I will conquer you, you will not have dominion over me anymore. That may be one of the most exciting and rewarding and, and spiritually alive things that ever happens to a person. Oh God, the world is a scary place to live in. And you know, living is a scary thing to do. But when I want to run away, praise God that I can say, my Lord will never fail to see me through. What do I want to see? Oh, I'd love to see Lake Michigan as, as it was when I was a child on those beaches. Uh, I spent hours and hours and hours on the Lake Michigan beaches in the summertime, and I'd love to be able to see what it looks like, to be able to look over miles and miles of that water and just see that, that blue that stretches on forever and ever and ever. I'd love to see I'd love to see a weeping willow tree. I'd love to see what Jane looks like. I'd like to see my boy. My father said many years ago, son, you have two choices. You can either get up and live, or you can sit around feeling sorry for yourself. I think maybe that's the choice that God gives to everybody. You can get up and live, or you can feel sorry for yourself. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, in the name of the one who healed the blind and the lame, in the name of the one who rose from the dead, Yeah. 